tonight is our last study out of the book of Samuel. Um, I was going to close that thing down and then with, with the previous study on the witch of Endor and studying divination, I got to thinking and then what Saul experienced with Samuel was outside the realm of divination way outside it and um, so I got began to think about it and I began to think what it wh when I was going through the translation in the Hebrew what caught my attention was Saul would kept would kept asking her questions one of the qu and I put it down here uh, the, uh, he, he, what do you see what do you see what do you see and she says well I see a divine being coming up out of the earth and and he's and and he can't see it, and so he says, "Well, what, what's this form? What's this form? What's this form?" And 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 she says, "An old man is coming up, and he's wrapped with a robe," and and uh, then he and Samuel began a discourse. Now, what caught my attention is if this had been under in Jewish age, you. God spoke to these people through visions and dreams and trances and angels and and uh, donkeys and <laughs> you know, oh I mean, yeah, Baal. I mean, God talked to these people a lot of different ways than He does today because the third member of the Godhead dwells in us, and we, we, God lives in us today, and and so that all that began to be curious in me, and so I began to think, well, what was how how would we explain if it's outside of divination? It certainly was. Uh, it, it scared her to death. You remember? I mean, she screamed for a bloody murder when she actually when somebody actually appeared. Because that's that 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 right there was outside of divination. I mean, you spoke to the dead. They didn't show up. <laughs> he shows up, and she goes like, "Holy catfish! I'm getting out of here." And so that's how this whole thing started. So. I, I thought to myself, okay, then it, it's in a realm that I could grasp. I mean, I don't understand it. I, mean, I, I don't care about <laughs> dealing with divination. Well, what do I care? But the fact that it was outside of it, and it was in the realm that Samuel actually showed up and gave him the Word of God, uh, pr uh, both um, past Word of God that was already there as well as prophetic Word. That's how I got to think of what could that be. I believe it was a transfiguration. I believe it was a transfiguration. So I'm going to tell you why I think that tonight. So my text is actually coming from Matthew. So if you go to Matthew with me, and then because we've already studied the thing in uh, 1 Samuel 28. So I'm in Matthew. Uh, okay, since it's in the divine realm, how, how would we deal with this? Is there any occasion for us to see this before? And the answer is yes. We see it in the transfiguration. Um, and, I, and the first part of this phrase is really important. In Matthew 17, 1, it says, and six days later, six days later. Now, six days later is going to take us all the way back to verse 21 of, the, of, the, of chapter 16. The background to six days later, as far as what's happening at the transfiguration, is disciples that are coming out of one of the real heavy Bible studies, the transfiguration is going to have meaning to after six days. Six days later, Jesus took with him Three of the disciples that have been in the heavy Bible study, they're known in theology or, or, or in biblical studies, they're known as the inner circle. You'll hear a lot of theologians uh, refer to these three guys as the inner circle of leadership. Uh, uh, James, James and John, you know, they were brothers, and then Peter. Uh, they, brought, uh, they brought them up to, uh, he brought them up to a high mountain by themselves in Galilee, and he was transfigured. 
this word is translated in the New Testament, the word transfiguration as it here in Matthew, or in Romans 12 is translated transformed, and in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, it is used for transformed. Same word. And it means to change the form of. Change the form of. And in the human soul, if it happens, that it changes character and conduct and all that stuff. So this is kind of an interesting word. It's a compound. Which means to change. And morpho, which is form. And so it's kind of an interesting word. And he was transfigured before them. And three things happened. And, and later, um, um, oh, what's going to happen in the transfiguration? Look down to verse 9. Look down to verse 9 a minute, and I'm going to come back. Look down to verse 9. They were coming down the mountain. Jesus commanded them. He said, tell the vision to no one. Do you see that? Tell the vision to no one. The transfiguration, what they saw was a vision. Do you see what I mean? I mean, they, they saw a vision. Okay? Like television. They saw a vision. They saw something. Uh, and apart from Jesus really explaining all that, uh, what was happening, but anyhow, they, they, it's gone. So he was transfigured before them and watched three things. I, I talked about him now, the one that's transfigured. His face shone like the sun. His raiments became white as light. That's interesting, isn't it? White as light? I mean, I, I don't know if you could, I mean, who, who, has, who has color in that? But it's just a way of describing it, isn't it? Uh, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Now, one more thing is going to happen in a moment. Peter, but Peter, you know, quick on the draw. Peter answered and said to, to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. He's got that right. Let me tell you, there's always a right place, a right time to get the right things from the Lord. And he's right about that. It, it was good for them to be there. But you know what's sad? It's like a lot of people come to church, they're at the right time, the right place, with the right guy, teaching the right stuff, doing the right stuff. And they know that's a good thing, and they miss what they came for. They, they miss the whole experience because they don't take what the Word of God was saying to them seriously. They don't go home. The Word of God doesn't change their life. It doesn't change their attitude. Even though when they sat in class, they thought that would be very important to them. This is just what I needed to hear today. Yet it doesn't change their life at all. The Word of God is to transform you into the image and character of Christ. And if He doesn't start doing that, your Bible study, even though you think it's a good thing, it's not working good for you because you're not working it properly. Do you understand that? This is what these guys are going to do. It is good for us to be here. You know, he speaks in the plurality. It's good for us to be here. If you wish, so he thinks this is what this is about. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles. And he's a boost. This is a feast of the tabernacles business. Here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now, what he's done is really important because he's connected but he doesn't understand, understand that he does not understand the difference between the first coming and second coming. He's, he's looking for the kingdom coming. Right? And in the king, kingdom coming, Moses and Elijah are two key guys. And he has jumped, when he says booths for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, he's just went to the feast of, ta he's perceived this now, he's, he's, on, he's, he's done some stuff here in his soul. He, his whole soul has said, but, he, but this is stuff from the millennium. The feast of the tabernacle is designed, is shadow Christology of the second coming of Christ, what we call the second coming of Christ, is, it's 
the Feast of Tabernacles is about the living and the dead reigning with Christ on earth. Right? De by dead, I mean the resurrected. I'm not talking about the walking dead here. <laughs> All right? So it's good for us to be here. They've seen something. Moses and Elijah have been identified. And Christ has been transfigured so that the three of them are in, uh, uh, in the appearance of a vision. Their faces are glowing, yada, 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 business. <laughs> okay. While he was still speaking, say, uh, Peter always interrupting, and then God interrupting him because you're on the wrong track, Peter. And while he was still saying, this is really important, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. What would that be? The Shekinah glory. This is a big deal here going on. This is really big stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. You know what the Shekinah glory, you know why? why it moved over the people uh, and, and rested on the tabernacle. This is what this all is about. But, and, and he tells them something that's really important. Watch what he says. A voice, this is the third thing. We got the face change. We've got the color, right? The clothes change idea. Now we got a voice out of heaven. This is called the transfiguration. To these people, it was a vision. To God, it was supernatural out there, wasn't it? A voice out of heaven. Listen to what he says. Now, this is so important because this is what they missed. This is what they missed. This is what you're subject to miss if you don't, if you don't pay attention to what the Lord is trying to talk to you about through his word. He says, watch this now. He says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And he puts it in the imperative mood. That's a cool in the imperative mood. You know what they didn't do? These three guys, one out of the three got the lesson. Boy, I take those odds. Only one, but these are top. These are the top guys. A great. I, I want to emphasize that these are his top leaders of his. These are the inner circle, the top of the spiritual leadership team. Only one of the three got this. Now they they set in quite a Bible study. This is, I mean, this is supernatural. I mean, way out there stuff. And Peter's in the is kind of got in the ballpark with it. Peter missed. What Jesus told them in the heavy Bible study of Matthew 16, 21 through 28. And they're going to miss it again. Because they have their own opinion about the word of God rather than what they're being told. And that's a conflict between old man thinking and new man thinking. That's exactly what it is. It's a conflict. Conflict here. Jesus keeps telling them. They won't listen. God speaks to them. They know this is God. He says, this is my son. I'm well pleased. He's on the right track. I am well pleased. I mean, anytime God says that to your life, you're on the right track. I am well pleased. Shut up and listen. Listen to him. Listen. Listen to what he says. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces, and they were much afraid. They're terrified. Jesus came to them and touched them and says, Arise, do not be afraid. They listened to that. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself. He was back to his normal form. And as they were coming down the mountain, verse 9, he, tell, he, he said, vision to know now watch this one watch this now because this is where god wants them to listen to what he's telling them here's here's what he's wanting them to hear tell no one watch this until the son of man that's the messiah that's going to go to the cross and become the savior of the world the son of man the the perfect body that becomes the perfect lamb to take away the sin of the world tell the vision to no one until, watch this now, 
until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Forget this booth stuff. His disciples ask him, watch this now. This shows you where their mind is. Their disciples ask him, what should they, if they listen to what he said, they should be asking him about what? What's this death stuff you're talking about, right? They don't. The disciples ask him, they're in unity on this. They ask him saying, what then do the scribes say about Elijah coming first? He answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you, Elijah has already came. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. You know, they, what they do with John the Baptist? They, they, he's going to say, I'm talking about John the Baptist. They killed him. What are they going to do to the son of man? They're going to kill him. It was designed by God for that to happen. In the, in the great scheme of the plan of God, but did to him whatever they wish. Watch this. So also, see, that's the suffering part. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hand. Listen, that's what he's been telling them. That's the background of the heavy Bible study he laid on them that they pushed back on in Matthew 16, 21 through 28. Do you understand? Oh, listen. I can't read the Bible for you, you understand? But I'm telling you, this is heavy stuff. What did God tell him? What did God tell him as a voice out of heaven? Listen in the imperative mood, which means I want you to listen, to understand. I want you to learn, right? I want you to learn to live. I want you to hear it. I want you to understand it. I want you to believe it. I want you to apply it. That's what he's saying in the imperative mood. That's what he's saying to you and I. So also, this is the big deal. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Look at verse 13. They walk out, miss Bible study once again. And this is an unusual Bible study. Would you agree with that? This is... Pfft. Now, when Jesus was meeting with them, there was, they were talking, Jesus was talking to Moses and Elijah. Other, they didn't pay any attention to all that. If they understood it, they just saw him talking. When God says, I want you to listen to him, oh, this is what he wants him to listen to. You're not listening to him. You're not listening to obey. You're not listening. You're not learning the word of God to live it. I don't know what you're doing with it, but you're not living it. The idea is to live it. Look at verse 13. Then the disciples understood that he spoke about John the Baptist. That's what they walked away with. One guy got it according to the book of John, right? One disciple that was at this meeting was at the cross. Jesus said, Mary, take care of Mary, right? In, in our vernacular. One guy got it. One guy got what he said was, I've got to suffer, they're going to kill me, and I'm going to be raised from the dead. John, John was there. John, John got it. The other two, top, top leaders of the team, did not get it. What did Jesus tell him? Yeah, did he tell him over and over? Was it repetitive teaching? Of course it was. Then they have this spectacular episode in their life called the Transfiguration, which was to focus on the message. And he tells them, Listen, there's going to be a cross before a crown. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. I didn't get it. So my heart's desire is you come to Bible study that you get it. It's, and listen, if you, if you pay attention to class and get the message, then he wants that message lived out in your life by your choice. It's important you, lo you know that. And when you do, then you'll want to hear the word of God taught to you. You'll want to hear it. You'll be passionate about it. Because... It's the food that carries you from one episode of your day to the next episode of your day with joy. <laughs>
with joy. You know, you can get from one episode to the next one, but not always with joy. This is about joy. Consider it, what? All joy. That's way outside the human realm, isn't it? I mean, when everything's going my way, I can consider it joy. But when it don't go my way, then what do you consider it? Do you still consider it joy? <laughs> uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll study. I give you a moment of silence as a believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess your sin. That's protocol to proper Bible study, confession of sin, mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue. First John 1 John 1.9, if I confess my sins, I'm talking about it personally. If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just forgive me and cleanse me from all of my unrighteousness. This is the key to sanctification, which is the key to the ministry of the Holy Spirit teaching me the truth of the Word of God. He puts it in my soul that he can put it out. We walk in the power of the Spirit. We walk by faith in the power of the Spirit. That's, that's the phenomena of the Christian life. And here's where it begins. This is where it began in the disciples' life. They just didn't get it. They were at Bible study and never got Bible study. It never, they never got it. You need to get it ahead of the crash program. You don't need to be in cram, the cram crash program to get the Word of God. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way to study, and I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this lesson to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Saul has this experience with Samuel. He has this experience. And when I was paying attention to that, I thought to myself, Saul's experience, if this, this was quite an episode, Life, wasn't it? I mean, this was real deal, like the transfiguration. This is way out there. I mean, it's exclusive. It no matter what outside kind of interference or what, what, what you're not going to go anywhere with it. You'll somehow fit, uh, write it off as some kind of weird experience or something. But I thought to myself, Saul's experience, when that came to Saul, he was in a, in a, in a crucial moment in his life, wasn't he? Critical. Crucial and critical. Mm -hmm. Spiritually. And why God is going to allow him to, this, this little deal to go through, why he's going to allow it to go through is to get, listen to me, God is long-suffering and he doesn't want anybody to go the hard road. He doesn't, if you're, right, if, you're, if you're on a rocky hard road, that's not God's choice, that's yours. I mean, the testing that God gives you are good and wonderful. And the, the, when you look back, you go, I wouldn't have, I don't want to go through it again. Or I wouldn't took anything for it because what I learned through that experience in my spiritual life was so. God, every, every once in a while, puts us in a situation that says to a guy like Saul, who is carnal and a reversionist, says to him, this is a time for you to get right with God. And listen, listen, if you don't realize it, three people that show up at, at that episode in your life, that's a crash, a crash experience, like boom, like one of those kind of things. The th three believers that show up, even if they got a half a wit of sense, is going to say, whoo, I think you just got a wake-up call, right? I mean, this is stuff God does with all of us, does he not? And, and we can see it in other people's life, but when it happens in our life, we think, oh, gosh, you know, I should have been driving careful. I should have done this. I should have done that. We, we walk it away. I can see that, that, that other people need it, but I don't. Uh, 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 Quit that foolishness. Own it. Right? That's what we tell, well, we tell that person sitting in that car that just had that thing. We say, listen, you need to take ownership of this and, 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 and get your life right business. Well, this was his moment. I mean, God, if you study the Bible, you're going to see God do this with people all the time. He did it with Jonah. We're, we're in the book of Jonah on, on starting Saturday in mythology, and you see, you see it in that. You, you see it everywhere in the Bible, and this is it. I mean, God, listen, he wants him. Yeah, this is like the prodigal son in David. I, I say this, as a reverse nation believer, it was Saul's spiritual moment 
to confess his sin and be restored to his father-son relationship. He's not going to be king. God said, you're, you're out. But listen, what isn't out, that's a service. That's just service. What is not out is his sonship. The service is out. You're, I'm, I'm not going to give you any more authority over anything that I'm doing. That's, that deal's done. But I'll tell you, what is not done is the father-son relationship, right? Confession of sin is not about getting something back from God. It, it's about restoring your father-son relationship, which is, which is better and more exciting in your life than any other thing you could be thinking about. Well, God, if I just had this and if I just had that. And he said, look, I tell you, the one thing you, got, you don't pay attention to is the father-son relationship. Forget about whether or not you got a, a dollar in your pocket or a car that will run. What you need is a father-son relationship that's on the, on the brink. And this was true in his life. It's true in his life. Listen, it was true with the prodigal son. What did he need? I mean, he had everything, went out in the world through. Listen, the world is, will take everything from you and want your life. That, the devil wants your life. The world wants everything you got, and the devil wants your soul. But you do understand that. The world, the world wants all your possessions. That, that's the stuff they want. That's why they come at night and steal everything. Satan wants to shut down your operation. That's what he's after. Shut it down. The prodigal son, man, he had him right. He thought he had him right where he wanted, and he had him there. But listen, how easy was for him, how easy was it for the prodigal to climb out of the pig pen of the world? The world put him in it. Satan tried to hold him in it. And listen, when he turned his heart to God, God lifted him up and out of that, cleaned him up, and he's back into business. Come on. No 12-step program here. Listen, there's no 12-step program. It's a volitional choice. At some point, everybody's got to come to that final step. I don't care if it's 15, 20, or 100. That's just, all you're doing is recycling the bad. Nothing good is coming out. You're just recycling the old bad stuff. And listen, you want it, you want it, you want something, go, you got to go to Father. The, he desired the, the relationship with the Father. The Father gave it to him. The Father always wants it. You don't have a sin, sin big enough that the, that the blood of Christ does not take care of because the Father wants a relationship based on faith and grace. Oh, God, if you just get me out, I promise I'll do this. Oh, God, if you'll get me out of this, I promise I'll do this. He's not going to respond to that kind of foolishness. Listen, everything that he did to pull you out of the muck and the mire was done at the cross. All that other stuff is just gobbledygook foolishness. I'm buying into that foolishness. You want out of the muck and mire of this world? You want out? Then go to God as a son. Go to the Father. Claim him. And he'll pull you out of the muck and the mire. And, you, and the credit all will go to him and none to you and nobody else. Won't be some mediator down there. The mediator between your sinfulness and the righteousness of God is Jesus Christ and his work at Calvary. That's the deal. Jeez. The prodigal son did it. David did it. David did it. David was smarter. He did it before God said, you're not, you're not going to be king anymore. Listen, if he'd pushed on, God has done the same thing to him. David feared he would do to him what God had already done to several ahead of him. Didn't want him to remove the Holy Spirit. He didn't want to. Listen, he's, he's, he's back to back with Saul. You think he didn't know all that stuff in Saul's life? David is back to back with Saul. And he's saying, boy, I don't want that. I don't want what Saul got. Well, then you better sh shape up, Right? How do I do that? Confess your sins. Let the blood of Christ work for you by faith through grace. It's not a work system. You don't work your way out of your addiction. You don't work your way out of your addictions, your bad habits, your bad attitudes, your bad, la bad lifestyle. You know, that I'm the good guy out front and behind the door. I'm, you know, I'm the witch of indoor. So let me talk about a few things. For example, why couldn't Saul see him? Saul never saw him. 
He kind of asked her, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? So I'm saying, well, 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 what's he look like? What's he look like? What's he like? What's he like? You know why? Because he's negative listening. God got to come off. Listen, he's in reversionism. He's in reversion. You can't see anything godly in reversionism. That's why you're headed, you're headed to places you don't want to go. I mean, this guy lived in a time when he could have seen visions and trances and dreams and angels, all kinds of things. And we think they were better off than us. I said, there are people in the church saying, boy, I wish I could see visions, dreams, trances, and angels. Oh, boy. Listen, you got the third member of the Godhead living inside your body, you dummy. I say that with sweetness. <laughs> I'm just all fired up. Listen, why did he seek a disciple of Satan to even get a message? He wants a word from God. He goes to a disciple of Satan to get it. I mean, how screwy is that? And he, doesn't think, he thinks that, well, that's, that seems sensible to me. That, listen, Ron, that makes sense to me. See, that's reversionism. You, you, listen, you cannot believe how deep and dark you could get in reversionism as a believer before God pulls a plug. You, I'm going to write this verse down because you need to read this. You need to read Ephesians 4, not now, but later. Ephesians 4, 18 and 19. Because it says when you get deep into reversionism, Bob Thiem called it, a vacuum opens up in a soul, and rather than the Word of God going in that, because you've shut down the divine side, the vacuum opens up volitionally, opens up to negative, and evil goes in. And you know where he got it? He got it right out of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, in this 1819 passage. So we got it. And he is absolutely right. You study any of the characters in the, doctor, in the Word of God that went through this, that's exactly what happened. That's where Saul was. Listen, and you know how easy it would be to change that and get back into the relationship of the father and son, which is all about, listen, I, I love this. How bad is it? Look at here. Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God is poured out into our souls by the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. How good is that? The Spirit witnesses to our spirit in salvation in Romans 8, chapter, verse 15, 17. The Spirit witnesses to our spirit that we are a child of the Heavenly Father. And no matter how far away you get from that, the Father has not moved an inch one way or the other. He has never wavered on that commitment He's made. The problem is not that he's drifting from you. You're drifting from him. And how do I get back? Row, row, row your boat jet. No, you confess your sin. Right? <coughs> I hope somebody on the internet is listening to me tonight. Listen, here's another thing. What did Samuel learn? From this, what did I mean? What did Saul learn from actually speaking to Samuel, who was dead? <laughs> well, the truth of the matter is, he got the word of God. The first part of the word of God says, "You know, you screwed up, but you can get back." The second part of the word says, "But either way, I'll see you tomorrow." Samuel, I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow you're going to be with me. And he still didn't listen. He's on the deathbed. This man is on the deathbed. And God says, God throws him a rope and says, you don't have to make that journey on death. You've lived alone. You don't have to die alone. Get home. And he would not do it. Tomorrow he's going to die a tough one. He's going to get hit a few times and then take his life. Coward. 
Listen, when you live like a coward spiritually, you'll die one. That's what you learn from Saul. This whole thing, oh, if I could just talk with Samuel, if I could just talk with Samuel, I can't talk to God. I'll get a disciple of Satan. I'll talk to Samuel. And what do you think you'll get from Samuel? The truth of the Word of God, you can't handle it now. Point number one. I can't believe it. I'm just saying point number one. I mean, I don't know how many points I should have on your paper right now. I know I have four, but how many have I already given you? I got least. You've been over quite a few already. I know. I just put it on paper. The Holy Spirit does everything else. This, the key word in the Greek of the transfiguration of Jesus, the key word is metamorpho, means to be changed into another form. This word is, is translated transform in Romans 12, 2, and transformed in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, 18, and they are well worth your study. In Romans 12, 2, the verb metamorpho emphasizes the change of the inner man by the cycling of the word of God by faith. Right? I mean, how many times have we seen that? By the renewing of your mind to know what the will of God is, that is good, perfect, and acceptable. Yes. Yes. You know why? Because we walk by faith and not by sight. It's a simple principle. It's a divine principle. It's either you walk, but you can walk this way or that way. It's going to walk. So let me tell you to walk by faith and not by sight. Not by sight. Listen, why? Even if you got sight, it couldn't help you. They got, they, at the transfiguration, they got sight. It didn't help them. Saul got sight. It didn't help him. Well, he got the, vo got the voice and the word. I don't know what he saw. He kept telling her, what do you see? What do you see? I don't know if he, if he, what he saw. But listen, 2 Corinthians is a really biggie one. 2 Corinthians, for me, is the really biggie. In 2 Corinthians, third chapter, 17, 18, and they're both word. This this is really a passage that's well worth your time. The metamorpho is to change the inner man so that the change is consistent with developing character and conduct that's compatible with the character of Jesus Christ. And he talks about it, and he talks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in involved in that in this passage. All about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we walk by the Spirit and not by flesh. See? We walk, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. And, and you can see the power dynamics of how God has developed that for the life that you and I both live. This is well worth your time to spend some time with that. I want to show you something, though. If you'll go over there to Corinthians for me just a moment. Let me, let me push a few ideas around for you. to When you, when you begin to study this, you will see the greater passage in here. In the third chapter, uh, Paul is talking about Moses and the law, and he talks about a veil. He says in verse 13, and are not as Moses who used to put a veil over his face that the sons of Israel might not look intently at the end of what was fading away. You know what it was? The word of God. The Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Law that was fading away. In other words, it was designed to operate until Christ come. The law was to point out sin and the need of a Savior. Agreed? That's the book of Galatians. But their minds, verse 14, but their minds. See, that's why, that's why transformation is about your mind. And, but it's, it's more than learning of Romans 12. It is the application of that into your life, the learning for life. But their minds were hardened. See, that's reversion. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed only by Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord, and, he, and he, now he says, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom, spiritual freedom. 
we are we we but we all with un which is an interesting word in the Greek face with unveiled face because it's been removed by Christ. Therefore, we come to God with unveiled face. Do you understand how big a deal that was? With unveiled face, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, there's our word, into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. That's how that whole deal works, is what he's saying. Okay? That's how that whole system works. Transformed into the image of Christ that works glory to glory to glory to glory. Glorious, glorious, glorious. All right, here's the second thing. One of the most interesting manifestations of Jesus Christ occurs in our lesson text. The transfiguration of, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ along with Moses and Elijah. The background to the transfiguration is, is enormously important to these three disciples as well as you and I. The six people who attend this transformation, six people attend this transformation, right? Six people. We got six people up there. Six people attended the transformation, the transfiguration, but that should be transfiguration. But the lesson in it was designed for only three. Whoa. You getting it? He picked out his three top guys and he said, come go with me. Just like he did in the garden. They, they get it there, they won't get in the garden either. You understand? Until you make up your mind that you're going to follow Christ, what he tells you, that you're going to follow the directive will of God in all of its details, this is going to be the person you're going to be. This is the person you're going to be. I don't know how to tell, you, tell it to you any other way. These three, these three disciples of Jesus were considered as in a circle of spiritual, mature, super grace leaders. These are the top guys. These three were part of the background story of Matthew 16, 21 through 28. And in verse 28, look at this. In Matthew 17, look at verse 28, because we got it verily, verily, except they only de they only de uh, Matthew only deals with one, very, uh, one truly. Look at this. Look at it. But we know what that means, right? We, we, if you're studying with me on Sunday, you know when you got a truly I say unto you, or a truly, truly, you, you're into... I'm um, in 18, 17, 17, or 16, I'm in mean, chapter 16, 16, 28, somewhere I got a 28. Truly I say to you, at the end of this heavy Bible study of Matthew 16, uh, 21 through 20, truly I say to you, he puts it at the end, and and we're supposed to say what at the end of it, which means... What, whatever you said, I'm, I'm, taking it, I'm taking it out into my life. So, so let it be, right? Right? Listen, listen, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. They, they're going to miss all that. They're... they're they're, they're going to miss all that. They're going to miss all that. That's a sad day. That's a sad day. He's trying to set that all up and try to show them something. Listen, there's got to be a cross before a crown. There's got to be a... Listen, you're going to stand and you're going to, see, you're going to see this. I want you to buy into it now so it just doesn't tear your guts out when it comes. Right? You're going to see a cross before you're going to see a crown. I want you to get it now. I want, you to go through, I want you to go through your grieving now because when that comes, we're in the period of joy. We're not in the period of mourning. Why? Because we're in the period of resurrection, aren't we? Joy in the morning. There'll be joy in the morning. After six days of heavy Bible study in Matthew 16, 21 through 28, these three disciples were taken to witness the transfiguration and learn its Bible lesson. But did they? 
See? That's the part that I, 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 I try to implore upon you in, in, in our Bible study. Three, I am sad to say only one got it. According to John 19, 26, 27, John. John. He couldn't even, listen, even, even his, own, his own brother, he couldn't get, he couldn't, couldn't get him on page. The others missed it because they walked by sight, not by, not by sight, not by faith. They listen. No matter what Jesus said, they already had their main up. You know, uh, all mixed. They they were like concrete, all mixed up and permanently set. And the, and and listen, Jesus himself changed their mind. It took the resurrection. It took the resurrection for him to go like cha ching. I could add a V eight. Jesus wanted all of them to have an inner spiritual transformation from witnessing to transfiguration. You get that? By cycling the truth of the word of God by faith, the second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 for us. Jesus changed his form to appear like Moses and Elijah, the face, the clothes, and then the voice out of heaven. The disciples were to pay attention to what the voice out of heaven commanded them. Listen to him. So, when we look at the bottom line of this lesson, what was the doctrinal point that God and Jesus wanted these three disciples to learn from the transfiguration? The answer, the answer to this question is to understand old man Cosmos Diabolicus stumbling block. You remember when in Matthew 16, Jesus goes, okay, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be uh, arrested. I'm going to be tried, right? Uh, they're going to kill me. I'm going to be raised from the dead third day. Peter took him aside and said, have you lost your mind? Do you know how upset the disciples are going to be with this message? Oh, jeez. Oh, man. Oh, jeez. Jesus says to him, Get behind me, Satan. Right? You are a stumbling block to me. That stumbling block was what they believed. It was their mind, right? Their mind was like that concrete of an idea that Jesus said... There has to be a cross before a crown. You guys are not getting it. You think there's going to be a crown without a cross, and I tell you, there's no way. There's no way that can be. And no matter what he told them, no matter how much they loved him, and no matter how much they believed in him, they were not going to believe this part of his teaching. They weren't going to do it. They made up their mind. Or I might say their mind was already made up. They weren't doing this on the fly. <clears throat> I read today that Jews still reject Christ for that very same reason, because he did not fulfill that promise of coming as a human sacrifice. Well, sure. They still, they still use that as the basis of rejection. But you know what, yeah, but you know what Jesus says? It says, well, what's your alternative? Their alternative is where the veil is. It's the law. Okay, then what's your alternative? What's your religion? The Mosaic Law. Their religion is law. <clears throat> I mean, it's not like they don't have an answer to that. They don't believe that Christ is the answer to remove the veil, that he fulfilled the law. They don't believe that. I feel sad for those who are dying without that. I feel, I feel, I feel enormously sad for that. <clears throat> the answer to this is their stumbling block. Their stumbling block was in their mind, and their mind was already made up uh, that it was a kingdom, and, and, and uh, that kingdom come, that, you know, Humpty Dumpty business. They're, I mean, let the, let the you know, it's, you know, the Humpty, Humpty Dumpty set on the wall. <clears throat> Listen, the answer to this question that I posed is to understand the old man, Cosmos Diabolicus thinking, and listen, they're, uh, they've got the word. They're using the Bible and the word of God. 
but they're wrong. And when the truth is revealed to them, no matter who taught it, they push back on it. Whatever else that was, whoever taught them and they bought into it, they're staying with it. They're sticking with it. They, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. The king and then the kingdom. The king and then the kingdom. So he says to him, you know, your stumbling block. The stumbling block was their, their mind. That's, that's Romans 12 too. The, you, your mind, when you're wrong, you're, you have to have the renewing of your mind. So that you can get into the will of God and that you have the eyes to see that is good, acceptable, and perfect. Listen, in this episode that we're in in this study, either Peter or God must change his mind. That's what it is. It, because Jesus is not changing his. I mean, he's headed to the cross. So it, we're down to it, either, either Peter or God has got to change his mind. How's that going to work? Listen, it ain't gonna work. It didn't work for him. It won't work for you either. <laughs> it's not gonna work. Either Peter or God must change his mind regarding the death, burial, and resurrection of his son. It ain't gonna happen. Peter's got to change his. He, he's got to become. And this will be better for it. Got to got to clean up all that cobwebs of foolishness in him. That listen, it, the word of God when when he. When he bought into a false concept of the word of God, it become, get behind me, Satan. That's a powerful idea. I mean, that's just a powerful idea. And the, therefore, a voice, a voice out of heaven at the transfiguration, like I need one more thing, a voice out of heaven. And they all go like, oh, it's God. I don't know how they got that. It's God. Voice out of heaven. I mean, it was, it was another thing out of old covenant. You don't get voices out of heaven anymore. You get them out of your soul. The Holy Spirit speaks them through the canonization of the word of God. You don't get voices out of heaven anymore. No, everybody in this room has heard God speak an audible voice. Listen to my son. Listen to Ron. Hey. <laughs> Do that. Do that. This is a different dispensation. But listen, in this dispensation, these guys would hear that stuff. They'd hear, they'd see visions, trances, all this kind of stuff. Listen, even with all of that, even a voice out of heaven, transfiguration, and a voice out of heaven? Wouldn't that be interesting to what the, how that's that? That really was, God just spoke. And they put, listen, Peter or God? Peter went with Peter. Peter punk and eater. I mean, Peter stayed with Peter. That's what happens to so many Christians that I meet. They just stay with themselves. Not going to change. I don't believe that. Well, what, what's the Word of God say? Let's look at the Word of God. It don't matter what you show. Their mind's concrete. Can it change? Absolutely. Volitionally, changes from the inside don't change from the outside. We talk till we're blue in the face. Nothing changes in their life. Their life still sucks. Or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah it says. Ron Adamus. We're down to Ron Adamus terminology. And so, and so here's what we got. Matthew 17, 9. Television to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Thank God they got that. Because, boy, did they preach that, right? They stormed the world with that message. So, you know, there's always hope in there. Oh, yeah. Hopefully it's somebody else's resurrection, not yours. But Matthew 17, 12. But I say to you, that's part of that verse, so also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. You know, or truly I say to you. Then the disciples understood, verse 14, then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. He had the transfiguration thing he's talking about. Where did John, oh, Elijah, oh, I see. Well, I would have thought that Jesus Christ would have trumped both those guys, and I would have thought the voice out of heaven would have trumped everything. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, I don't know. 
I don't know. All right. I've blabbed enough. <laughs> Boy, don't. So that's what I think when I'm with Samuel. <laughs> I went to the back door to get that message, didn't I? It was interesting. Yeah, right. Well. <laughs> yeah, I'm listening to it before a trumpet. And the voice of the archangel. Well, anyhow. Let's have a word of prayer. For those who have visited with the internet, yeah, this is the way we are most of the time. Just hungry to teach. To try to get you to understand how important the Word of God is to your life. And when He gives you the directive will of God and a command or such things as this tonight, no matter where you are in your life, whether you're the prodigal son stuck in a pig pen somewhere you just see there's no way out there is if you're a believer confess your sin God will lift you up and out of that deal and restore you if you're not a believer then believe that Jesus died for your sins was buried and raised from the dead third day and he'll lift you up out of that muck and mire he'll free you he'll free you if you're like David you're in a position of authority in your home or your nation or your church and you've failed in all of those responsibilities in the most sincere way, serious way, God will pick you up and like he did David when David confessed his sin, came back to the Father and asked, told the father how thankful he was that he was a father of mercy and grace. The prodigal son, when he got home, he was so thankful that God is a God of grace and mercy. I pray that over your life tonight, Father. We thank you for this study. We thank you for the opportunity to speak to other people around the world through the Internet. And I pray the things that we've taught tonight for some people, they may have to listen to this several times just because they haven't had the opportunity to sit in a teaching church like this. And I pray the Holy Spirit would encourage them to grab a study night, a Tuesday, one of our Tuesday nights or Wednesday nights or Sundays or all of them, but pick one that you can stay with and be consistent. And you'll see the Father begin to teach you principle upon principle, doctrine upon doctrine, line upon line, precept upon precept. And out of that will come spiritual growth momentum in your life. And out of that comes a new man in Christ. Developed from, built from the ground up, from the foundation up. The foundation of salvation, out of that comes the character and conduct of Christ. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen.